lovelies and welcome back to Listen Closely. I am your host Bobby and thanks for tuning in for yet another week. Lately we've been doing all those holiday shows and episodes where we talked about traditions and backgrounds and stuff like that. So this is actually the first week that we're going to be going back to the original topics of you know just true crimes, paranormal, cryptozoology, and all the good stuff that you know and love. And if you haven't already, please follow me on all my social medias. That's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, at HTT, listen closely. Or you can also email me, HTT, listen closely at gmail.com. If you're listening on Apple, please leave me those five stars and give me a review. It can only help me. So for this first real show, or like, you know, back to the original, we're going to be talking about one of the most notorious killers from Houston, Texas. And it kind of goes along with my latest post that I did. I did a post about child abuse and especially the sexual abuse. And it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Kids, unfortunately, can't really stand up for themselves. So we as adults have to be there. We have to have that listening ear for those kids. You know, because they, they're still learning. They're children. They don't know whether it's good things or bad things. So we as adults have to know the differences in the children's behavior and when to say something. We always say when you see something, say something. And that's something that everybody has to do, especially for these children, because they just, they're so young and innocent and they just don't know any better. So without further ado, let's just jump right into this. We're of course talking about Anthony Allen Shore, aka the tourniquet killer. Now Anthony was born June 25th, 1962 in South Dakota. He would later move with his family to Texas and they would settle down and you know he would live his life he actually got married not once but twice once was in 1983 where he had two daughters but the couple later divorced and then once in 1997 and that also ended in divorce where she later accused him of abuse so just a little background of Anthony Shore he grew up with two younger sisters and they did move frequently so their family I said they moved to Houston Texas but they did move quite a lot so they jumped from you know like North Dakota to Florida to you know all these different places but they would eventually wind up in Texas he also had some anti-social behavior at a young age he said that he was being harassed and he also was doing some harassing and molesting of his female classmates and some Sometimes some younger friends and quite possibly his sisters. So from the get-go, this guy is not good. Something was clearly wrong. Some people say it was due to bullying that basically fueled him to do that. Others say it's just you're always born a monster. Who knows? Who really knows? I mean, that's just, you know, some speculation as to, you know, the younger him and what happened. But yeah, so he he gets married and gets divorced but from his first wife in 1983, and they had two daughters. You know, that's already starting to not sound like a good picture, especially with all his, you know, background stuff. Let's go ahead and get into some of these murders and assaults and, you know, what he did as far as crimes and his span of crimes. So, Shore's first known victim was 50-year-old Lori Tremblay, who he picked up while she was walking to school. And after attempting to sexually assault her, he would then go on and strangle her. Now, this was September 26th, 1986. So they don't have as near as good forensics as they do now. So when her body was dumped and found later on behind a restaurant in Houston, they basically had no leads. I mean, they said, some said that, yeah, we saw a van, but they they just didn't have anything on her. I mean, there was there was seemingly no connection whatsoever and during this murder Shore would later go on and say that you know he killed her by strangling her with a ligature and I want y'all to remember that because that's actually going to play a little bit on in the interrogations but I just want y'all to remember that so uh, Lori was unfortunately killed by strangulation with a ligature okay and that was the first known one or that we know of and again The police had no leads, no nothing. So they were kind of stumped. The second was Maria del Carmen Estrada. Now, Shore would sexually assault 
and strangle Maria on April 16th, 1992. She was 21 years old at the time and she was a Mexican immigrant working as a nanny. So she was actually on her way to work. She did look very young for her age and they believe that's why he went after her because she's actually one of the older ones that he went after. So I will go ahead and say he went after children, babies, but she was older, but she looked younger. So they believe that's why he targeted her. Estrada's body was found in the back of another restaurant that exact same day. So her body was found pretty quick. So then we move on to the third, Selma Jansky. And on October 19th, 1993, Shore would enter her home and then would later bind her and sexually assault her. However, he did not kill her and instead fled the scene on foot. Now, you're probably wondering, how did he get access to her home or how is he finding these girls? And he worked as a, I want to say it was a telephone pole, like lineman, if you know what I'm saying. So like he was around the neighborhoods. It gave him access to places that he probably would have never had access with. And he was perceived as a really nice guy. So, you know, when a nice guy at the time, they didn't know any better when a nice guy rolled up in a van and said, hey, you know, I'll take you just a little bit further down the road. There's no reason to really really doubt it so and I mean if you see him from time to time or you see you know him in his uniform no big deal so that's I think how he was able to manipulate people was he got this like nice guy personality and others would eventually go on I mean it's kind of the cliche that everybody says oh well he was a nice guy never would have thought of him and things like that you know like the predator in sheep's clothing you know just regular clothing that kind of thing I think that's how he was able to get away with this I don't know I'm just saying. And let's rewind a little bit. So they actually did not link Selma to the last two murders of Maria and Lori because Maria and Lori were both picked up from walking and then were later dumped behind restaurants where Selma was just, you know, attacked in her home. So they obviously did not link any of that together. They thought Selma was just some other thing that happened, like just some other perverted person that did that so they didn't link that initially to the case it wasn't until diana ribola diana ribolar uh that we started to get a little bit more into like the modus operandi which is you know someone's habit of working particularly in the context of you know criminal investigations and it's, it's translated as the mode of operating. So, you know, the, the way in which they killed. Okay. So Diana, what happened with her was on August 8th, 1994, uh, Shore beat, sexually assaulted, and strangled Diana Rebolar. She lived in Houston Heights area of Houston at the front of a small complex. On the day of her death, she was seen at a local grocery store because she was sent to go get, you know, a few things from the grocery store. Now, granted, she's a nine-year-old. And I know nowadays we're thinking, there's no way I would send my nine-year-old down the street alone to go get some groceries. I mean, that's not something that we see nowadays. But again, this is back in the 90s that this one happened in 94. You know, just things were different back then. And, you know, growing up in that time period, and like, I can't really say because I was only two at the time. But, like, you know the difference. Like, even when I was a, you know, younger child versus now, it is so much different. So, you know, back in that time, it wasn't really, you know, looked at or given a second thought to send a child to go get groceries. So, on the day of her death, she was seen at that grocery store. Employees saw her leave the store safely, but she never returned home. She was found the next day on a loading dock behind a building. The police were given a lead by a neighbor who described a van that frequented the area. So this is where we're starting to see the modus operandi. She was connected to the Maria del Carmen Estrada case because of it. She was killed with a rope with a bamboo stick attached, so like a tourniquet. So we're we're starting to see, okay, this guy likes to strangle people with these different things. And that one was with a tourniquet. And remember, this was 94, 93, 92, and then 86 was the first one. So he's he's gotten pretty far in this. Like he he's not 
He's not slowing down or anything. And he's actually getting a little bit more ballsy. So let's go to July 6th, 1995. Shore strangled Diana Sanchez, 16 years of age. Shore offered her a ride in his van like we haven't heard that before. But again, they still didn't really have that much connections. So, you know, nobody was really frightened or anything back in that time. So he picked her up in his van and killed her after she rejected his sexual advances. Seven days later, an anonymous phone call to a local news station, which was actually sure, directed police to her body in a Harris County field. So basically, if you've ever seen the Zodiac movie, or you know, you know about the Zodiac and how he called the news station and was basically taunting the police. Well, you know, they didn't find Dana's body for a little bit. So, you know, he was like, what the heck? I want recognition and I'm kind of feeling ballsy and taunting. So I want to... Let it be known that this happened. And and I want to, you know, get my name out there. Maybe I'll be, you know, just as good as the Zodiac. I mean, who's to say why exactly he did it? But he did call the news station. They did end up finding the body, of course. And that's where you start to see his cockiness. And again, he thinks, well, I can be as cocky as I want because I haven't gotten caught yet. They're still scratching their heads. They haven't linked any of my crimes to me nor to anything else. So I'm good. And that's the last one that we actually know of was uh, Dana Sanchez. But there's no telling how many other women he went after or, you know, was looking into. So, you know, the police are like, what the heck? No leads whatsoever. All they have is the killer likes to use tourniquets and, you know, kill his victims. That one, Selma, who was just sexually assaulted but not killed, they haven't even linked it to the rest of these. And and to give it even more background, so, like, during this entire time, that he is murdering these girls and sexually assaulting these poor girls. He has two daughters at home. And, you know, he's got sole custody of these two girls. How he got sole custody, we will never know. But he got sole custody of his two daughters. And if you think that he just was a perfect dad and, you know, was just amazing, did nothing to his daughters, you would be wrong. His own daughters his own flesh and blood he would expose himself to and molest and you know just have them in horrible living conditions um i saw one documentary where one of the daughters was like you know we lived horribly you know we rarely took baths we lived with bug infested house and just it was not good cps was called a couple of times on him but he always seemed to be one step ahead of the government and so he'd be he'd be like hey say this to them when they come if you don't i'll beat you or you know like he had it to where those girls were so petrified and they didn't know any better again they were children themselves they didn't know any better that this is not normal this is not what families do they just assumed and then they were just so scared that they didn't want to say anything because they were scared of the repercussions So, finally, in 1998, he was convicted of molesting his two daughters. So, it took until 1998 for him to face any kind of charges for all the things he's done. And it's only for molesting his daughters. And because of that, he only gets two years of probation for it. Only two years of probation. Like, that is, like, one of the most failure, how the crap... Do you molest your own kids and only get two years of probation? And then just like, hey, you can, that's fine. Go walk the streets. Luckily, though, at you know, as a result of this, he was required to provide the police DNA samples. So, we finally have his DNA in CODIS. And I've talked about CODIS before. CODIS is that nationwide DNA database that if you're a criminal, you're entered in CODIS. And then anybody from anywhere can, you know, enter some DNA they have in a case and see if you match it. So that's like one of the best things to have ever happened was this database. So finally, he is entered into CODIS in 1998. His very first assault, other than his children, was in 1986. So it took this long for him to finally get into CODIS and required to provide DNA. I mean, I'm just, I know I keep repeating things, but it's just so frustrating. And this is, like I said, this one has really got me. So in 2000, detectives pulled the Maria estrada case from the cold files and tested dna evidence that was actually found under her fingernails so you know when 
She was fighting Shore off of her. She scratched him, got his DNA under her fingernails, and they kept that. And finally, they were able to get a full genetic profile. Now, the results were not immediately matched to Shore. You would think, ta like, you know, finally. But no, they weren't immediately matched to him. Because of an audit on the lab, they had to send the samples to Dallas. So it was actually not matched until 2003. And that's finally when Shore was arrested for Estrada's murder. So finally, we're starting to see some justice, you know, even for his daughters. Because just two years probation, that is not justice. So finally, October 24th, 2003, he is finally arrested. We're starting to see some justice. Like, we're starting... Again, arrested doesn't mean anything, but, like, it's a start. So, he gets arrested. 11 hours into his interrogation, Shore finally confessed, not only to the murder of Maria, but to Diana and Dana. He also confessed to the murder of Lori. And he admitted to the rape of Selma. So, finally, he is admitting things. He's like, you know what? 11 hours in, you know how police whittle them down. And thankfully, he started to talk. Now, this is where you're like, finally, we're going to start seeing something. Well, detectives had no way of linking the first murder, Lori, to the other three murders because she had been strangled with a ligature and not with the tourniquet with like a bamboo stick that was attached, like the rope tourniquet with the bamboo. So they were trying to, you know, figure out, well, you know, did he, didn't he? So when they asked him why he switched to a tourniquet, he replied, because I hurt my finger while murdering Lori. Like, are you serious? So he used the ligature on the first one. And then he was like, you know, oh, poor me. I hurt my finger, so I'm going to use the tourniquet of the bamboo and the rope instead. Like, I, so while reading this and researching it, like, I wanted to basically, like, slap him this whole time. On top of, you know, all the bad things he did, like, I just wanted to slap him. And I'll tell you a little bit more why later, but just, like, ugh. I'm sorry, this one's really getting to me. So, finally, he's doing his, you know, admissions of guilt. We're starting to see stuff. But despite his confessions to the murders of the four girls and to the rape of another, they decided to charge him only for Maria Estrada's murder because it contained the most forensic evidence. Those fingernail DNA full profile. So they were only able, or they only wanted to convict him for that one. Luckily, it paid off. So his trial began in late October 2004 and the jury finally, finally found him guilty of capital murder. Now, during the sentencing, Shore's daughters would have to go up and testify against him. His only surviving victim went and testified against him. And in less than an hour, they recommended that he be put to death and so be it. So he was sentenced to death on November 15th, 2004. Now you think, okay, he's sentenced to death, like done, get him out, get him gone, like get rid of him. No, that's not how the legal system works. So he had quite a few stays, which means they halted his execution quite a few times. And if you're his daughters or the surviving victim, or even the families of the murdered victims, like this has to tear you apart. Like, it's just got to be like a gut punch that he had so many stays for different reasons. Anthony Allen Shore was executed by lethal injection on January 18th, 2018 at 628 p.m. and was actually the first person executed in the United States in 2018. He was 55 years old when he was executed. So, like, this guy got to live a pretty long life, which he did not let his victims do. His victims didn't get to live their beautiful, long lives like they were supposed to. They didn't get to have their first kiss or have their first love and, you know, things like that. He was given so much more than his victims. Like, yeah, he was in prison, but he still lived to the ripe old age of 55. And to make things worse, which is why I told you that I wanted to punch this guy. So before the execution, he confessed, you know, I made my peace. You know, I'm good. You know how all, or you think all executions, like, yeah, I made my peace. I'm good to go. But his last words were, ooh, wee, I can feel that. Because, you know, lethal injection. So they started, when they started to pump in those doses of medicine, you know, like the first dose is supposedly to, you know, make you go to sleep. So that way, you know, the second and third go in. So the one that makes him unconscious or like the first dose entered his veins and that's literally his last words before going unconscious and then eventually dying. Like, are you serious? 
that's what you want to say? Ooh, we, I can feel that. Like, that's why I wanted to punch this guy so hard. Because this guy is a monster. And thankfully, we see an end to the story. But, you know, for those poor children that were never able to live their lives. For his daughters, who had to go through so much counseling. And I'm sure that, you know, it still impacts them. Like, I just can't even imagine for his daughters, for his family members, for his victim who did survive and her family members or, you know, the victims, families that of those that passed away. Like, I can't even imagine it. And that's why I said at the very beginning, we have to pay attention to the children. I don't have children personally right now, but I just feel so strongly on this one. Like, we have to pay attention. You know, locally, some news broke out of something that happened here with a predator. And it just tears me apart. And it's sad that these children just are so innocent that they may or may not know any better. So we, as adults, have to, you know, be proactive. Talk to these kids. Know when something is wrong with your kids. That's all I want to say on this one. Because I don't want to really talk about him. Because as I said, I'm not here for the killer. I'm not one of those shows that glorify the killer and stuff like that. I'm not that type of person. He was a monster. Straight up. End of the story. He was a monster. I just feel horrible for his victims. And I know I got really passionate about this one. I can't. I can't help it. Like when it's with kids and such young and multiple and even his own, his own daughters. That's just too much. I know I've covered some kids in the past, but it's just, it's a whole nother level when it's a sexual assault on these children. So I just want to real quickly just say I'm sorry for those victims and for those families that have gone through this or anyone else who not only, you know, not Shore's victims, but anyone who has ever gone through any kind of abuse, whether it be sexual, whether it be physical, I'm sorry. I don't know why there are such horrible people in the world and I wish there weren't and I can't even begin to imagine what you've gone through, but you are strong for continuing every day you are strong. So I want to commend anyone who continues, even if you have a loved one, you are strong. That's all I have to say for this. If you can only do one thing, always remember to listen closely.